Hi TubiTubers, I'm Julie, your animation buddy on the TubiTube channel. Before we get started, thank you so much for your comments. After two months of practicing by moving points and lines, it's time to introduce new theoretical concepts that will help us improve our technique and skills as animators. In this session, we'll learn the meaning of the terms keyframes and in-betweens. If you haven't heard of them, now's the time! Before we dive into the exercises and definitions, I would like to show you a component of the tupi tupi interface known as onion skin, which has been helpful for us from the beginning to practice comfortably and smoothly. Onion skin is the feature that allows us to partially see the content of the previous and next frames in relation to the frame we are currently working on at the moment. It's thanks to the references from the previous frames provided by the onion skin that we can easily deduce the position and shape of the element we are animating in the next frame we are going to draw. Within the tupi tupi interface, the onion skin controls are located on the far right of the toolbar at the top of the workspace. The first control determines how many previous frames will be shown in the workspace. The default value is 1, but you can choose more if you like. However, I must warn you that selecting more than 3 can make it confusing when drawing new frames. My suggestion, work with 1 and only increase the value temporarily for special situations where you want to observe the trajectory or behavior of an object to make specific adjustments. Once you've made the adjustments, set the value back to 1. The second control serves the same function as the first, but for the frames that come after the current frame. Either of the two controls can be set to zero if you only want to see the previous frames or just the following ones. If both controls are set to zero, you will only be able to see the current frame. As you can see, the onion skin allows for a wide variety of configurations, depending on how you prefer to work. Again, the most common way to work is by using one previous frame and one following one. Additionally, the onion skin feature has another control that defines the transparency level of both the previous frame and the following ones. This level is defined by a decimal value we'll call the factor, which ranges from 0 to 0 0.99. The lower the value, the less visible the elements in the previous or following frames will be, and the higher the value, the more visible the objects not drawn in the current frame will become. The most practical default value for working is 0.5, but you can slightly vary it if you want to experiment with other values. Just make sure that they don't stray way too far from the midpoint, otherwise the onion skin won't be very helpful. Okay, it's time to get into the details. Let's talk about keyframes and in-betweens. Generally, a piece of animation is made up of dozens of frames. For example, if we are working with a frame rate of 24 FPS in a scene that lasts 3 seconds, we can say that this scene consists of 72 frames, 3 seconds multiplied by 24. Now, out of those 72 frames, while all of them are necessary to create a smooth sense of movement, there is a smaller group that determines the path or behavior of the element we are animating. We will refer to this group of frames as keyframes. To give you an idea of what the keyframes are in an animation exercise, you can simply look at them aesthetically in a single image to understand what will happen in the scene, even without seeing it animated, as shown in this example. It's important to clarify that there isn't an exact science for detecting or defining the keyframes of an animation. For simple paths, it can be trivial. But in more complex cases, the artist may choose different sets of keyframes for the same exercise, and this doesn't mean that there's a right choice or a wrong one. It's simply different solutions to solve the same problem. That said, there's no doubt that with plenty of exercise, you'll develop the instinct to choose keyframes for your exercises with increasing accuracy. Now, if the role of keyframes is to define the path or behavior of an element, what is the role of in-betweens? To address this question, let's visualize an animation exercise, but only showing the keyframes. Do you see what happens? There is no fluidity in the movement of the element. While keyframes provide information about the trajectory, they are not enough to create a sense of continuity in the motion. 
This is where in-betweens come into play. The role of in-betweens is to connect the keyframes to each other, thereby creating the illusion of movement. Generally, once you've defined the keyframes for your animation, it's relatively easy to calculate where the in-betweens will be placed. Of course, practice makes perfect. The more exercises you complete, the easier it will become to define both the keyframes and the in-betweens. Now it's time to roll up our sleeves and work on an example. As is customary in all of our sessions, we'll start by launching the Jupyter publication and setting up a new project. For this exercise, I'll define a blue background in the color palette. And for the line stroke, I'll choose a dark green. This time, we'll work with the line thickness of 8. But how does the practice we're going to develop consist of? It's very simple. We're going to simulate the falling of a leaf swaying in the wind until it reaches the ground. However, it's important to clarify that we'll continue with the same dynamic as the exercises done in the previous session. In other words, our main element in the scene will be a line. Alright, the first thing we'll do is imagine the path the leaf will follow as it descends from left to right and vice versa. The second step is to mentally define what the keyframes will be for our exercise. In my case, these are the keyframes I'll be using. Once we've visualized the entire exercise in our minds, we'll proceed to draw each of the keyframes that define the leaf's trajectory. In my case, in the first frame, the leaf will be outside the workspace area at the upper left edge of the canvas. In the second frame, it will be halfway to its return point to the right. And in the third frame, it will be at the first return point, while in the fourth frame, it will return to the midpoint but this time much lower because it's falling. And so on, I'll continue making the key positions the leaf will pass through. Using the onion skin controls, let's take a look at how all the keyframes appear together. The path the leaf will follow is clear. Now let's see how our exercise looks from the player by pressing the N key. By the way, make sure the value in the FPS control is set to 12. And as you can see, we'll need the help of in-betweens to complete our little practice. We return to animation mode by pressing the enter key again and we're going to add all the in-betweens we need. To do this, we'll use the Insert Frame button located in the Options bar at the top of the Exposure Sheet. We'll add a new frame between each of the keyframes and start drawing the intermediate positions of the leaf. As we add new in-betweens, it's important to keep checking on the player to ensure the animation is taking shape. Remember, it's a slow process and animating is an art that requires a lot of patience to achieve the best results. As you conduct your reviews, you'll likely want to adjust the shape or position of the leaf in different frames to create a falling effect that looks natural and fluid. Now, let's take a look at the final version of our exercise. How does it look? Do you think the leaf's movement is natural? Let me know in the comments. And, as usual, we're going to publish it in our community. After completing our practice, it's easy to wonder what would happen if I didn't use the keyframes and simply start drawing the leaf from the first frame to the end. It's likely that I could have achieved a similar result. 
However, the process could be very different because by drawing the frames sequentially, I wouldn't have clarity on the leaf's path and will probably have to make many more corrections throughout the exercise, taking much more time, of course. My point is that as we add new and improved practices during the creative process, we'll enhance our technique and make our work easier. At the end, the result of our animations will be much better. Alright, with this last example, we've reached the end of this series of exercises featuring a line as the main character. In our upcoming sessions, we'll start working with slightly more complex structures. We began with a point and then moved on to a line. You can probably guess what comes next. In our upcoming animated practices, we'll discover it together. And also, don't forget to keep practicing. Remember that it's not enough to complete our exercises just once. The more you repeat them, the greater skill you develop as an animator and digital artist. Thank you so much for sticking with me until the end of this content. If you enjoyed it, give it a like and leave a comment letting us know what kind of exercises you would like us to explain in our future practices. And don't forget to subscribe to stay updated on our new posts. Doobie doers, see you in the next video. Stay tuned!